Welcome to the Clutch Kitten Gaming Podcast, where I play an indie game for five hours and let you know whether or not it's worth your time and money. Hello and welcome everyone, this is James, also known as Clutch Kitten, and I am so glad that you're here for episode 46 of the show. It's finally starting to feel like I'm getting settled into my new place, and that's a lovely feeling because it means I can finally get some extra gaming in. I recently bought Octopath Traveler, which has been an absolute joy to start, and I'm looking forward to all the indie games to come. Before we get into what I was playing this week though, there's an important piece of news to mention. You know all those rumors about a smaller, more portable Switch that have been going around for a while now? Well, the rumors are no more because the Switch Lite has been announced. There are a few notable differences though, apart from it coming in some incredibly nice colors. First off, the Joy-Cons are not detachable. They're just baked into the actual kit this time around. This goes hand in hand with it not being a dockable system. Basically, The Switch Lite is meant for portable play, and portable play only. Going along with that theme, not only is the device slightly smaller, the screen is smaller as well, at 5.5 inches. Another small but important thing to note is that because the Joy-Cons are built in and don't need that local player functionality, the left Joy-Con now has a D-pad. Last but certainly not least, the Switch Lite is priced at $200 instead of $300, like the standard system. So, who is this system for? I personally think that my wife and I are prime targets for this product. We already have a Switch, but it would be really nice to have a second one so we could play games together like Stardew Valley. But, it's kind of a waste to buy a second baseline Switch when we have no use for that second dock. What I'm trying to say is that I think it's a great, cheaper option for families that want multiple Switches. People are also mentioning that this is a great option for kids since there is no longer that removable Joy-Con functionality. There are less moving parts, which seems like a better thing for kids. I think the main thing to ask yourself if you're considering buying this console is whether or not the loss of docking functionality will be a deal breaker. If so, maybe save up for the mainline console. If not, the Switch Lite seems like a beautiful piece of hardware that you'll be able to pick up on September 20th. Let's move on now to this week's game. This week we're going to be talking about Clatter, a turn-based arena tactics game developed by the one and only Face Punch Studios. If that developer sounds familiar, I wouldn't be surprised since they developed some very beloved games, including Rust and Gary's Mod. Clatter was released on December 10th of 2018, and I believe it's just available on PC. Face Punch is an interesting studio because they are technically based in Walsall in the UK, however, most of their team works remotely from across the globe. Apparently they have 35 employees spread out over 12 countries. Face Punch has also made a bunch of other games, but if you recognize the studio, it's most likely through Rust or Gary's mod. Clatter currently costs just shy of $10, although I should mention that it does have microtransactions. This isn't common in the games I review, but there are purchasable cosmetics that you can use in-game currency or obviously real-life money for. From what I can tell, none of the microtransactions actually affect the gameplay, which is good, but they're still there if that's something that bothers you. In terms of game length, the career mode is only a few hours long if you're relatively good at the game, but the replayability is supposed to come in with online play. When it comes to controls, I personally used mouse and keyboard and it worked just fine. I'm actually not sure if they even have controller support, but if they did, the game is slow pace enough that I think it would work fine with that as well. Let's move on now to the narrative. In a world filled with millions of identical white cubes, a genius shape has dared to invent the game, nay, the Battle of Clatter. As a child, he was mocked and insulted. They called him a square when he couldn't party after school, but all that time, 
he was developing the cutest looking battle robots you've ever seen. Now that he's an adult, his battle robots have shaped the course of sports history. His game has even broken into the Church of Cubism. The great 3D has declared Clatter divinely inspired. Now that it's officially the world sport, you've decided to step up to the line to try your hand at the championship league. So I'm going to be completely honest, that entire intro was made up because Clatter essentially has no narrative elements to the game. You are technically playing the coach of a team of battle robots, and you are a giant white cube, but beyond that, the game gives really no context to the world. In the career mode, which is the main solo play option, there are sponsors and mechanics and lots of robots to choose from, but beyond creating your own team, there are no storylines to follow. It's weird because this might be the first game I've looked at on the podcast with truly no narrative elements. Although there's definitely a place for systems-driven games in this space, I have to dock this game for not even having a screen with some text-giving background to the world. By the time I got far enough into the game to realize that the narrative wasn't a factor, I was truly hoping that the gameplay would pick up some of the slack. Let's see now if it does. What do you look for in a turn-based tactics game? I know for me, it's about getting small advantages. Unlike a turn-based strategy game like XCOM, where the thrill comes in connecting a shot with a 45% hit chance, tactic games like Into the Breach and Chess are usually less flashy. What makes those games exhilarating is knowing that you have absolute control over what your pieces do. You and your opponent, at least in the case of chess, have the same exact tool set, and nothing is up to chance. It's all about who can outwit their opponent. That's why the tool sets available to players are crucial to the enjoyment of tactic games. So how are the tools in Clatter? The biggest area of choice you have outside your matches is in the robot selection. There are mortar robots, a grabbing robot, a shooting robot, and many more. Each one presents a new puzzle to solve in terms of synergy and use. In addition to the ability to choose your 8 robot starting lineup, you also get to see the play space before you lock in those choices. The battle grids are always symmetrical, but vary from simple designs to more complex spaces with tiered levels and teleport pads. Once you lock in your lineup and place them in the first two lines of the grid, the match starts. The first two turns are the slowest since you only get one and then two actions, but once you hit turn three, you get three actions every turn until the end of the game. From my time playing, Clatter felt a lot like a combination of chess and Into the Breach. You don't get to see your enemy's upcoming turn like Into the Breach, but a lot of the robot abilities are very similar. Unit placement is key, and there are lots of displacement and area of effect attacks. It feels a lot like chess in the slow tension that's created on the board. Three actions per turn was actually a great design choice because it forced you as the player to make some tough choices. This is a game of sacrifice, misdirection, and combos. At this point, you might be thinking to yourself, if this game is a combination of chess and Into the Breach, I should buy it right now. Chess is one of the greatest games of all time, and if Clatter feels like chess, shouldn't it rank with the Masters? Into the Breach was also one of the best games of 2018, and if Clatter is just an iteration on that, it has to be good. Well, before we get too far down that rabbit hole, there are some flaws and key differences that we need to discuss. First of all, Clatter really doesn't do anything to further the genre. Outside of its amazing art, one of the key elements that made Into the Breach such a hit was the mechanic of seeing your opponent's moves before they went. Subset games iterated on the genre in an incredibly fun way. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for Clatter. I do appreciate some of the smaller systems, like the arena getting smaller as the game goes on, but there's nothing that wows me when I play. Second, a large part of what makes chess such a timeless game 
is the simple complexity, or the complex simplicity, whichever way you want to think about it. Chess is the exact same every single game. The only factor that changes is your opponent, yet as each turn progresses, millions of new board states open up. It's insane. Clatter feels like it's stuck in a weird purgatory between simple and complex. The core systems aren't interesting enough to keep me coming back for more, and even though the arenas change up every match, it felt inconsequential. To be fair, there's a lot of complexity in this game as well, but there's nothing that prompts me to boot it up instead of Into the Breach or XCOM. I have absolutely no connection with my robot units, I have no narrative to riff off of, and the gameplay is good, but not unique in any tangible way. The developers had the goal of making this a multiplayer focused game, and even on that front, it's sad to say that there seems to be no one playing. I tried to queue up multiple times for a match for at least 3 or 4 minutes and had no success. Unfortunately, this seemed to be a theme from some of the other reviews I was reading. The career mode had some fun sports-like elements, but even those weren't enough to keep me hooked. The upgrades were boring, and although the sponsor contracts gave me some additional objectives to chase after during matches, they started becoming repetitive. Now that we've made it through the narrative and gameplay, let's discuss the art and sound design. On the art side, there's a small glimmer of hope. Unlike the many depictions of future robots being rusted out piles of garbage, Clatter takes a nicer looking approach. The robots in this game are super clean and super cute. If you weren't literally using them to blow each other up, you wouldn't think that they were battle robots. They have nice designs and simple aesthetics, which was a refreshing change from what I was expecting. Although the visuals aren't award worthy, they are more than passable for the game. On the soundtrack side, there's really nothing that stands out. The soundtrack is repetitive and forgettable, and the effects are… fine? I prefer to give you more details, but there are only so many ways to say that something is average. Now that we've made it through the narrative, gameplay, art and sound design, let's summarize with some positives and negatives. First off on the positive side, the core tactical play is fun. Like I mentioned earlier, there were plenty of times where I did feel an enjoyable tension to the gameplay. Also, because the grid changes every match and opponents use different units, there's never one strategy that works best. Because of that, it encourages experimentation with new techniques. Second, the game looks very cute. Despite there being a lot of robot destruction, it has a very arcadey and lighthearted feel. First off on the negative side, I feel as though the lack of narrative structure is just unforgivable. The more I review games, the stronger I feel about the importance of storyline. Unless you have a game that's as blank a slate as Minecraft, you should at least present some baseline world context. Second, the gameplay was not innovative in any meaningful ways. In today's gaming market, it's almost better to be disastrously terrible than to be faultlessly average. Unfortunately for Clatter, it takes its stand in the unbroken yet mediocre bucket. We've made it now to the final boss. This is the part of the podcast where I let you know whether you should slay the game and buy it, flee the game and avoid it, or farm up and wait for a sale. My verdict is to flee this game. If you buy it, will you have fun? Sure, you're not going to hate your life while you play, but you'll probably feel like you wasted some time afterwards. This is a great example of a game with a very positive rating on Steam that really fails to reach that bar of excellence. If you're looking for a turn-based tactics game, I would recommend Into the Breach over Clatter every single time. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to listen in. I always feel a little bit bad for making a whole episode about a game that I disliked, but I still hope you found value in today's episode. Don't forget to email me at clutchkittengaming at gmail.com 
or DM me on Instagram with your questions and thoughts. And if you really like what you hear, I would love it if you told a friend about the show. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you in game. <laughs> <laughs>